Here we're going to take a look at two important classes of cyclic fully conjugated hydrocarbons, the polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons and molecules called annulenes. Aromatics are not confined to just one ring. Aromatic compounds consisting of fused aromatic rings are called polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. And when we say fused, we are referring to two rings that are sharing a bond. So for example, in this kind of cartoony case, the blue bond that's shared by both the ring on the left and the ring on the right is called the fusing bond, and the rings themselves are said to be fused. We can distinguish two classes of polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, the so-called benzenoids, which consist of fused benzene rings, and the non-benzenoid compounds, which consists of rings that are larger or smaller than the six-membered benzene ring. The most important benzenoid polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons are listed here. All of these are aromatic and they all satisfy the 4n plus 2 rule. Naphthalene has 10 pi electrons, 4 in the ring on the right and 6 in the ring on the left, and consists essentially of two fused benzene rings, where the fusing bond is right here. There are actually two ways to fuse another benzene ring onto the structure of naphthalene, fusing to create a linear structure of three benzene rings using this bond leads to anthracene, a molecule consisting of three benzene rings fused in a linear fashion. Fusing in an angular fashion using this bond leads to a molecule containing three benzene rings fused at an angle, and this molecule is an isomer called phenanthrene. Introducing another ring into phenanthrene by adding two carbons that are linked here and here results in the molecule pyrene. All four of these molecules have structures and reactivity that resembles benzene, indicating that they're aromatic. For example, they don't undergo addition chemistry in the presence of electrophiles, instead opting for substitution, just like benzene. The non-benzenoid polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons consist of ring sizes different than six. Two examples are shown here. Azulene is a constitutional isomer of naphthalene. Just like naphthalene, the molecule has 10 pi electrons, indicating that it's aromatic. However, this molecule isn't as simple as it looks, as we'll see in a second. Looking at the second example, an oxygen-containing analog of azulene, we might be hard-pressed to understand how this molecule is aromatic. The key to understanding this molecule is to consider resonance structures involving a lone pair on this oxygen atom within the ring and the CO double bond. This is actually a common theme when it comes to aromatics containing heteroatoms that we'll return to in later discussions of aromatic heterocycles, thinking about resonance. An important resonance structure of this molecule involves donation from the oxygen within the ring toward the CO pi star orbital. In the resonance structure resulting from this electron flow, we can see pretty clearly that the molecule has 10 pi electrons corresponding to the five pi bonds within this resonance form. The fact that this resonance structure appears aromatic indicates that it's probably very important to the overall structure of this molecule. The importance of this resonance structure gives us structural insights. For example, since this resonance form is aromatic, we might expect this oxygen to be more negative than the oxygen of a simpler non-aromatic ester, something like ethyl acetate or something with just a plain vanilla alkyl ester. A related idea comes up if we look at the electrostatic potential map of azulene. If we were to look at azulene from a sort of classical introductory chemistry perspective and ask whether this molecule is polar or nonpolar, it appears completely nonpolar because it's made up of CC and CH bonds, none of which are strongly polarized. However, if you look at the electrostatic potential map of this molecule, we see that it is actually heavily polarized, with the seven-membered ring having much less electron density than the five-membered ring. What's going on here? Why is this molecule so polarized? Well, again, resonance can come to our rescue here and help us understand why this polarization leads to a stabilizing effect in the molecule. Consider a resonance structure in which I push pi electrons to shift charge toward the five-membered ring. Electron flow like this is indicated by this electrostatic potential map, since the right-hand side of the molecule, the five-membered ring, appears more electron-dense, more electron-rich than the left-hand side. This electron flow leads to the resonance structure that I'm drawing here. And clearly, this resonance structure is a pretty good representation of the molecule as a whole, since it illustrates the electron-rich nature of the five-membered ring and the electron-poor nature of the seven-membered ring. But what's so special about this resonance form? The thing to notice here is that if we look at each of the rings individually, each of the individual rings is aromatic. So I'm highlighting the seven-membered ring first, and notice that we've got a cyclic structure that's fully conjugated with six pi electrons, two due to each of the pi bonds. That's an aromatic 
substructure within this molecule. Let's consider the five-membered ring separately now. I've got a five-membered ring that is fully conjugated. It's, of course, cyclic. It's planar, and it contains six pi electrons, two due to the lone pair and two each due to the pi bonds. This substructure within the molecule is also aromatic. What this analysis helps us see is that this polarization stabilizes the molecule by creating two distinct aromatic systems. This results in an aromatic stabilization energy that's greater than it would be in the absence of this polarization. And you can see the polarization in the shapes and occupancies of the molecular orbitals. So far we've been talking about cyclic, fully conjugated hydrocarbons, which have this pattern of alternating double and single bonds. And that's kind of a mouthful to say cyclic and fully conjugated every time. There is a term that's been invented to refer to these cyclic, fully conjugated hydrocarbons. They're, they're called annulenes. And an annuline containing N carbons within its ring is called an N annuline, with the N in brackets indicating the ring size. Depending on what criteria of aromaticity they satisfy or don't satisfy, annulenes may be aromatic, anti-aromatic, or even non-aromatic in cases when they're non-planar, which comes up due to steric hindrance in some cases, or to avoid anti-aromaticity. We can think of cyclobutadiene, benzene, and cyclooctatetraene, three molecules that we've talked about previously, as annulenes in their own right. Cyclobutadiene is anti-aromatic due to its four pi electrons, while benzene is aromatic, while cyclooctatetraene is best described as non-aromatic because although the molecule would be anti-aromatic were it fully planar, in actual fact, the molecule is non-planar. This tin annuline is in a similar situation, and this one's remarkable because it would be aromatic, right? It has 10 pi electrons, so it would be aromatic, but the molecule is non-planar, and it's forced to be non-planar due to the orientations of these hydrogens, which I kind of have to draw in in a strained way just to show them distinctly. These hydrogens would be bumping into each other severely in a fully planar structure, so the molecule has to take up a non-planar geometry. Examples of larger annulenes are shown here, 12 annuline and 14 annuline. 12 annuline would be anti-aromatic again because of its number of pi electrons, but adopts a non-planar geometry to avoid this. With 14 annuline, we're back to 4n plus 2 pi electrons, and thus this structure is decidedly aromatic. And so the annulenes provide a nice context in which we can explore these criteria for aromaticity and see what makes a molecule aromatic anti-aromatic or non-aromatic.